Does it sound sexist of me to tell you how much I appreciate watching all of these pregnant women waddle off the platform after <laughs> singing? I just love it. I just love it. I'm so delighted with these ladies. I'm a dinosaur, aren't I? <laughs> Slightly younger than T-Rex. My text for this morning is John chapter 17, verse 8. John chapter 17, verse 8. Please locate that verse. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Once you locate it, John chapter 17, verse 8. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking to his heavenly Father. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Won't you please be seated? As I have been saying for months and months, John 14 through 17 is a record of the greatest conversation found in the Bible. Why do I repeat myself so? Why do I say this again and again and again? I want you to go to your grave recognizing what treasure we have been given with these four chapters in John's unique gospel account. John chapters 14 through 16 begins the record with the Lord Jesus Christ's conversation with his 11 remaining apostles on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where the Savior prayed and encouraged his men to pray, and where Judas Iscariot brought the soldiers to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ, to complete his treasonous betrayal for 30 pieces of silver. John chapter 17 concludes this greatest of conversations. It is the longest recorded prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible, though by no means the Lord's longest prayer. He prayed through the night a number of times during his earthly ministry, but those prayers are not recorded for us. This prayer is referred to by the majority of commentators as the Lord Jesus Christ's high priestly intercessory prayer. The more familiar prayer of Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 through 13 that begins with the words, After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, so often referred to as the Lord's prayer, is no such thing. On that occasion, the Lord provided something of a template for his disciples so they would better know how to pray. What we have here is something else entirely. Whenever you want to come as close to hearing the Savior talking to the Heavenly Father as is possible this side of eternity, you will turn to this chapter of God's Word to read. In the first five verses of John 17, the Lord Jesus Christ prayed to his heavenly Father for himself. Beginning with verse 6, he prayed for those 11 men. To help us with the context, let us read verses 6, 7, and 8 once more. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Remember that in verse 6, the apostles overheard the Lord, their Lord praying, and, and they may have been somewhat surprised to hear him speaking to the Father about them, rehearsing to the Father what he knew of them. 
Verse 7 is where they overheard the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the Father, the Savior telling him what they knew of him. Focusing our attention on verse 8 once more, in this portion of his prayer, the Lord Jesus Christ made mention of what he has done, then what the Father has done, and then three things his remaining apostles have done. Everything about verse 8 is a summation of events that have already occurred. Verse 8 begins, For I have given unto them the words. The Lord Jesus Christ here summarized his three and a half years of earthly ministry instruction of them for the purpose of training them for the ministry after his departure. Dedokos, have given, is a form of the Greek verb that we've seen before. This word you've heard me pronounce, didomi, didomi, that means to give. That's a word that Christians ought to be familiar with, amen? The Greek word for give. Give, give, didomi. Uh, <clears throat> this form of the word shows that the Lord has given God's truth to those men. Verse 8 continues, the words which thou gavest me. Using the same Greek word didomi, the Lord Jesus Christ rehearsed to God the Father in his prayer that his gift to his men was what the Father had given him. I previously mentioned that although the Lord Jesus Christ did not give everything the Father gave to him to these men, everything they received from the Savior was originally given by the Father to his Son. Recounting God's blessings to him in prayer, as the Lord Jesus Christ did here, is always a good thing for you to do, for me to do, for anyone to do. Thus, what the Lord Jesus Christ gave was what he had been given. That, too, is a good thing. Has God blessed you? He, he did that. That is, he blessed you so that you could in turn be a blessing to others. After all, nothing good that you could ever give to another did not first come to you from God. Amen? What hast thou that thou didst not receive? This is so characteristic of the Savior's dealings with human beings to so perfectly represent God the Father in his earthly ministry by not only reflecting the spirit of the Father's desires, but also the content the Father wanted him to communicate to those the Father has given him. After acknowledging the sources of the truths he imparted to those men, both the immediate source of truth, what he gave to them, and the ultimate source of truth, what the Father gave to him, the Lord Jesus Christ reported to his heavenly Father what was already known. But in doing so, he demonstrated, listen to this, he demonstrated a pattern of accountability that serves as a wonderful example for every follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be mindful that the Savior displayed his accountability to the Father. He displayed it to his men. The Apostle Paul shows in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, that it is a very, very poor Christian indeed who lives a life and who pretends to serve the Savior without accountability? 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2 reads, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Where do you think the evangelical Christian community of the 21st century came up with the notion that there is such a thing as unaccountable Christianity? <clears throat> you see no such thing with the Savior. You see no such thing with the apostles. You see no such thing with first century Christians. 
Yet the notion has spread far and wide in our day that no one is or should be accountable for their lives or for their lifestyles. God's plan is for children to be accountable to their parents. Amen? And when they're no longer accountable, they're no longer children and probably shouldn't be living at home anymore. <laughs> That's another sermon entirely. Adults who marry are to be accountable to their spouses. And Christians are to be accountable to their churches. Just as pastors are to be accountable to their congregations. If you know an employee who is not accountable to his boss, you know a job that won't last for long because businesses that try to function that way go bankrupt. Accountability is reality. And unaccountability is a dream world. After modeling his accountability to the Father in full view of his chosen men, the Lord Jesus Christ began his reportage to his Father concerning his men, not because the Father needed the information he conveyed, but to serve as yet another model of accountability and reportage. Excuse me for using a French word. I, I like to do that once a year so that you won't think I'm, I'm a redneck from Texas. Notice the three areas of their faithfulness to their Savior set forth for us in logical sequence. First, and they received them. This is the Lord saying to the Father about his men. And they received them from the Greek word lambano, meaning to receive as true, this is the first responsibility for every human being, and especially of a disciple of Christ. We must receive the word as being true. Amen? Amen. We don't read it and then decide whether we're going to believe it. Amen? If you receive it as true, you decide you're going to believe it before you ever crack it open. And you ought to decide you're going to do it before you find out what it says to do. That's the presumption of one who receives the word. What a marvelous thing it is for the Savior to be able to say to his Father about them, and they have received them. Can that be said of you? Psalm 138 and verse 2 declares to us that God has magnified thy word above all thy name. Therefore, how pleasing it must have been for God the Father to hear the report of God the Son that these 11 servants of God received the word as true. How different those 11 men were from the majority of people in their day who did not accept the words of Christ as true. Let us be careful to do likewise, <laughs> not likewise the majority, but likewise the 11. The majority is almost always wrong about almost everything. Next, and have known surely that I came out from thee, do you give much thought to your decision-making processes? Have you ever thought about how you arrive at the decisions you arrive at? <laughs> By that I'm asking if you reflect. Do you ever reflect on the steps that you take to gather information and to evaluate that information so that you can make a good decision Recognize that most people do not do that and do not want to do that because it invariably leads to decisions that they have already decided they do not want to make, steps they do not want to take. Most people decide what they want to do and then 
seek to justify their conclusion with supporting evidence, having little regard for the fact that they have reversed the more wise approach to making important decisions. The wise approach is you gather information and then make a decision. Frequently, decisions just bubble to the surface and it becomes obvious. But that's not the way most people want to do things. They decide what they want to do and they seek to gather facts and information to support the conclusion they have already arrived at. And this is because most people don't really care what the facts are because they've already decided what they want. Consequences disregarded. Is this not the reason for the debacle that is taking place in Afghanistan? Both how we came to be in the country in the first place and how we came to leave the country in the last place. This is also the process that leads up, excuse me, this is the process that leads up to most marriages. <laughs> and with few exceptions, most of the career choices made by young people after they complete high school. Oh, they decide what they want to do, and then they start gathering random facts to support their previous conclusion, the conclusion they arrived at, absent facts. So a guy meets a girl, and she seems to be willing, and so he starts supporting the decision he's already arrived at. Hey, I got a willing accomplice here. Let me come up with information that supports that this wicked witch of the West would be a good wife and mother to my children. Women do the same thing. They pay no attention to the wise process that leads to good decision making because they have decided ahead of time what they want to do. And they avoid rational thought as a hindrance to getting what they want. Such people who approach life that way characteristically look down upon faith, as it is described in the Bible, as being unreasonable and illogical. How wrong they are. How wrong they are. Faith is a right conclusion drawn from circumstantial evidence, but not just any circumstantial evidence, the utterly reliable circumstantial evidence of the Word of God. Once you decide where the information you will use to make your decision comes from, you are almost at the correct decision already. Amen? You, you decide on this, you're about 95% there already. The third thing the Lord Jesus Christ informed the Father about concerning his 11 faithful apostles is their faith in him, which is to say the right conclusion they had drawn about him from the information they were willing to receive. They concluded that the Lord Jesus Christ came from God the Father. Thus, though they did not know everything about the Lord Jesus Christ, they would eventually come to understand and do you know everything you need to know or everything you might want to know before you have to make most of the decisions of life? No, you, most decision makers don't have the luxury of gathering all the information. No general knew everything about the enemy before he had to decide what he was going to do with his army. But you, you, you come to the place where you know enough. You know enough. And do we not see in this first and second thing our Lord said, the basis for the third thing, their faith? Romans chapter 10, verse 17, declares that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The first thing the Lord Jesus Christ told us was that these men had heard the word of God. The second thing the Lord Jesus Christ told us about these men, is that they have known surely that I came out from thee. That sounds like an approach to truth that will eventually lead to faith, does it not? It had with these men, the verse concludes, and they have believed 
that thou didst send me. This exemplifies faith. These 11 men are reported by the Lord Jesus Christ to have drawn a right conclusion from circumstantial evidence, and the right conclusion they have drawn is about him. They have concluded that the Lord Jesus Christ came from God the Father, but more than that, they have concluded that God the Father sent him. The Greek word translated send is pronounced apostello, from which we get the word apostle, meaning sent one. This is very appropriate since Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 describes the Lord Jesus Christ as the apostle and high priest of our profession. The Lord Jesus Christ is the apostle of God the Father, Paul, Peter, John, Thomas, and the other familiar apostles, they are apostles of Jesus Christ. Then there are the apostles of the churches, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23, such as Gary Matheny, Chris Goodman, Taki Korinidis, Eugene Kozachenko, Samuel Rye, and others sent out by our church and other churches to establish churches, you see a number of their names and letters on that mission board. Notice again the final phrase of our text, they have believed that thou didst send me. Jesus Christ was sent by God the Father. Jesus Christ in turn sent forth the apostles to fulfill the great commission, go ye. They in turn established churches that in turn sent forth missionaries. And while we send missionaries, we too are sent. Amen? This is where I want to take the time to arrange what we have learned in this verse according to an easy-to-remember sequence for you. Before doing that, however, I want to be very explicit about what we are given in this verse. We are given a true record about the transmission of truth, the passing along of facts, and information. This is important because the Christian faith, listen carefully, is the only belief system in existence that is based upon truths and an accurate account of reality. It is the only. There's other pretenders, but Christianity is the only. Let me caution you that facts in themselves are not saving. An accurate record saves no one from their sins. However, real history, an accurate record of events, actual facts, genuine truths, points to the only one who does save sinners from their sins. Only Jesus saves. Only Jesus bore our sins on the cross and died a sacrificial death, rising from the dead in victory three days later. Only Jesus Christ. Please look at our text one more time, playing, paying particular attention to the verbs, the action words that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. You will notice that there are seven verbs in this verse. The words have given, gavest, have received, have known, came, have believed, and send. I'll leave it to you to meditate on the reasons why we need not take the time in this message to deal with the verbs came and send though they are important in their own rights. For now, five verbs, five actions that bear directly on the apostles, those 11 men's spiritual well-being, and by extension, yours and mine as well. Consider them one at a time with me in their actual sequence. First, the word gavest. Though the opening phrase reads, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, we recognize that the actual sequence of events is different than the order of the words uttered in the Savior's prayer. 
One must possess what one then gives. Therefore, the sequence began with God the Father giving the words to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father gave to the Son what the Son then gave to others. The reason I specify that we are concerned with the sequence of events rather than the word order in this phrase is because the Father gave the words to His Son in eternity past with the Son doing what He did with the words during His earthly ministry. It is so important to point out what the Father did, He did in eternity past. You say, well, why is that important? It's important because we are not here considering an afterthought, are we? This is not the outworking of a contingency based upon uh, the basis of God recovering from a surprise, the entirety of God's word shows our involvement in God's unfolding drama of redemption with Paul's letter to the Ephesians being but one illustration. Please pay attention to eternity as I read to you Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 23. Now before I begin, may I coach you parents? about reading scripture to your children because you ought to read God's word to your children. There's two things to keep in mind when reading God's word aloud to your children. First, read slowly and with good pronunciation to your children. Read slowly and with good pronunciation. Secondly, Make sure you read smoothly and with, without hesitation uh, uh, along the way because that makes it impossible for them to understand what you just said. You've got to be smooth. Amen? When you read God's Word. It is difficult to follow halting and mispronounced words. Tracking the words with your finger as you read is what professionals do and it might be helpful for you to do so that you can read slowly, pronounce correctly and smoothly. With that said, I began reading to you Ephesians chapter 1 beginning with verse 3 and I want you to think about eternity as I read. Paul writes, Blessed be, God, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead 
and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You say, Pastor, you made a mistake. I know. You don't know whether I did it on purpose or not to show you how to keep going even when you make a mistake while reading to your children. And I will never tell you. Keep in mind eternity. We see Paul as he writes this single sentence <laughs> and how he harkens back to eternity past. Paul's comments help us to recognize that what we are seeing in our text, John chapter 18, verse 7, is part of God's eternal plan. Notice that God, <laughs> and aren't you glad, God bears no resemblance to the plans and actions of our nation's current administration. Next, the word have given. What the father did when he gave to his son, he did in eternity past. What the Lord Jesus Christ then passed on to his apostles, he did over the course of three and a half years of instruction, training, and rehearsal, which is to say discipleship. It's so good for every believer in Christ to be involved in some way in discipleship. May I point out an important consideration that comes to us from Jude, verse 3, which reads, The faith which was once delivered unto the saints. In that verse, Jude makes reference to a body of truth that was passed on to the apostles, which is the same issue that is before us in our text for this morning. But I want to emphasize to you the importance of the point the Savior makes that he passed on to his men what originated with God the Father. This is not to deny the central significance of the Savior's crucifixion in God's plan of the ages. It is to show that nothing the Father initiated or the Son fulfilled was not part of God's eternal decree. Turning from what He and the Father have done, the Savior now recounts that the apostles have received and they have received them should it be a surprise to anyone to learn that the same Greek word used by the Lord Jesus Christ here was used by the Apostle John in John chapter 1 verse 12 where we read, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You might ask yourself, how much difference can there be between receiving Christ and receiving the words of Christ. After all, is he not described in John chapter 1 and verse 1 and John chapter 1 and verse 14 as the word? It is no surprise to the heartbroken Christian mom or the broken-hearted Christian dad that their child who is indifferent to God's word is also indifferent to God's Son. And the child who avoids God's word does so that he might avoid consideration of God's Son. These men, on the other hand, quite differently than Judas Iscariot, do you want to have anything in common with Judas Iscariot? Do unsaved people ever, ever, Think about the fact that who they most resemble is not the eleven, but the one. Is, is that really a thing? Is that really what you want to do? Is that really what you want to be? That's not very bright. Different than Judas Iscariot, as they would discover for themselves in an hour or two following this prayer are said by the Savior himself to have received his words. These 11 men received his words. And receiving his words is critical to receiving him, as we shall see. To recap, 
In eternity past, God the Father gave His words to His Son. His Son then came to this wicked world via the virgin birth, and at the outset of His earthly ministry, He began to pass on those same words to chosen men who received them. They decided to receive them and then received them. Fourth, the verb have known. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee. This is the Greek word I've repeatedly rehearsed to you over the past couple of weeks, gnosko, referring to knowledge that is gained from instruction, knowledge that results from experience and discovery. Is it any wonder that such knowledge would be the result of having received Christ's words? One must receive the truth in order for one to then know the truth. Amen? Is it any wonder that those who stubbornly re resist receiving Christ's words will be correspondingly ignorant of Christ? You say, well, I just grew up in church. I know all about this stuff. No, 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 no. If your whole life you resist the words of Christ, your whole life you will, you will not know about Christ. You will be as profoundly ignorant about the essential things as some head-hunting head savage on the island of New Guinea. With respect to what is being advanced by the Savior here to receive from Christ words that originally were given to him by the Father, resulted in these men knowing by discovery, knowing by instruction, knowing by experience that Jesus Christ truly came out from God the Father. They know that. Now there are some truths that are unfathomable in and of themselves. One can figure out that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And eventually you can figure out that the square of the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the two sides, if you have enough time. But unless you submit to his instruction, unless you receive Christ's words that he received from his Father, you will never know that Christ came from the Father. You will never know. You might rehearse the words, but you'll never get it. You will pay a very, very high price indeed for refusing to receive the instruction of God's word. Mm. Those men received. The result was that they came to know. Finally, have believed, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Do, do you see the progression? God gave his words to his son. His son gave his words to his apostles who received them while others refused them. Having received them, the apostles acquired knowledge, didn't they? The knowledge that Jesus truly came from the Father, that resulted in them then believing that Jesus was sent by the Father. The progression in their lives from their exposure to God's word was initially reception, which resulted in knowledge, which concluded in believing an important truth. That profoundly important truth was that Jesus was sent by the Father. They believed that. Not in itself saving faith, you understand, since saving faith is faith in Christ, not believing that the Father sent him. There's a difference. But believing the Father sent him is the basis upon which saving faith is built. What we are given in this portion of our Lord's Prayer to the Father is the barest skeleton of how saving faith comes to be. I read again Paul's comment about it in Romans chapter seven or 10, verse 17, when he indicated, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We recognize that no mention is made by the Savior in this prayer of the Holy Spirit's role in saving faith, him being the spirit of faith, 
2 Corinthians 4.13, or that faith is the gift of God, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, rightly understood. What we have here are the essentials of the means of grace that precede, that lead up to saving faith. God the Father gave his words to his son in eternity past. For three and a half years, those men received Christ's words as he taught them, showed them, modeled them, and guided them. The result was that they came to know that he was sent by the Father, which then led to them believing that he was sent by the Father. The source of truth is God the Father. The channel of truth to those men was the Son of God. But they received it, came to know it, and then believed it. Yet for all that, it was not saving faith, was it? No. They believed truths to be true, which is important, but not saving. Salvation comes to those trusting the one the truths apply to. Salvation comes to those trusting the one the facts relate to. Salvation comes to those trusting the one the historical record attests to. Facts save no one. History saves no one. Only Jesus saves. Thus, once you receive God's word, and acquire knowledge of the truth from God's word, and faith that is built upon an acceptance of God's word, the decisive step, the saving step, the eternity-altering step, is to then come to Christ. And so many people don't do that. Only Jesus saves... Jesus personally saves, therefore trust this Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the Savior, for his earthly ministry to those men, for working in their lives, for, for this prayer to you that you allow us and them to over here to analyze, to study, to benefit from. Oh, Father, please, please help us to decide to always receive your word, to know what it says, to then believe what it says as the basis for leading to real saving faith in Christ for those that do not know the Savior. Blessed to that end, please, Father, draw sinners to Christ. Please, please, dispatch the Holy Spirit of God in a most important way to convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. Let their decision-making process be the correct one. And we will for that thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand at this time, if you would please, and take your hymnal, turning to hymn number 522.